speak to me your word. Good evening. Are we on? Okay. In the shadow of your wings, you find me seeking shelter while the battle rages on. And in the comfort of your mercy and pardon, I am safe with thee. I run into your arms, I lose myself in you. In the shadow of your wings, you will find me, seeking shelter while the battle rages on. And in the comfort of your mercy and pardon, I am safe within your arms. And I will say of the Lord my God, you are my fortress and a tower high and strong. As I run into your arms, I lose myself in you. I lose myself in you. I lose myself in you.
praise you for your grace. We thank you that you love us so much. We thank you for the gift of salvation, the gift of your Holy Spirit, and the gift of the ability to even love you. Lord, we know that everything we are and everything we do that is right and good is because of your grace. And we do thank you so much for that. We thank you so much for what it cost you so we know that it is valuable beyond anything on this planet. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us tonight. I just learned that whatever link I put up on Facebook will get you to this live feed, but then tomorrow the link won't be any good. Because, do we, is that what's happened? Because we end up switching it, you put it back on? Yeah, right. And so it's a different URL at that point. Oh, YouTube Studio. What are we going to do? So anyway, all right. No, I can go back and, and change those up. So if you're trying to click on a link in Facebook off of my page or the church page and it comes up dead, that's what happened. So uh, we'll go back and we'll change those links up so that you can find us later if if you are not watching right now. So if you're not watching right now, this is what you need to do. Thanks for being here. We are in Joshua. Remember something about Joshua. It's, all, it's really all about battles. And, uh, but those battles are there because there is opposition the opposition is something that you and I deal with on a daily basis if we are born-again believers. And, and that promised land is a wonderful place. It is a fruitful place. It is a place where, where the Israelites receive so much just by the very hand of God and by his favor, yet there's opposition. And so it is with you and me. We've received the grace of God. We belong to him and there is an enemy that wants to take us out. And it's not just Satan. I would say that our enemy is not just Satan, but our own sinfulness, our own sinful flesh, our own foolishness. Because when you and I got saved, it, we, didn't, uh, we didn't just turn into perfect people. Boy, wouldn't that have been great. But what happened is just a, a battle ensued, a battle that you did not have before you were saved, because now you have the Holy Spirit of God living in you. And so... Uh, and, and you do have a different life. It's, and, uh, it's an amazing life, but there are battles, daily battles, weekly battles, yearly battles, all kinds of battles. You and I think that we, you know, as Paul made it clear, we don't fight against flesh and blood. Our battles are, are spiritual battles, of course, but again, it's just fighting over our own foolishness. And, and, uh, like we think we're fighting all of the, the unbelieving governors and all of that stuff in our, in our state. And, and while, while we may not in, like what they're doing and, and all, and, and we believe that they are not thinking straight, they are not the problem. We are still the problem. And the Lord uses situations like that to reveal the problem in each one of our own hearts. And so... Uh, with that said, we learn through Joshua every battle we see, every, uh, every time an enemy is, is over, overcome, we can compare it to our battles in the spirit. So um, chapter six was great. Chapter six was awesome. I mean, it was their first 
their first battle, their first test. They passed it with flying colors. Everything was wonderful. They obeyed God. God wiped out the Jerichos. And then, and then in chapter 7, they went into Ai and tried to take out Ai. And that didn't work out. And they were surprised by that because there was such failure. And 36 men died in that battle. And they weren't supposed to lose any. And Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 says this. One thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. That's what we're doing today, tonight. That's what these guys are doing in chapter 8. They failed. They're feeling horrible. Um, and I, I'm reminded of my childhood days in, at the junior high school I attended, there was a skating rink right there outside our, I mean, right across the street, right there. And, and so we actually were the lucky guys. In, we got to have skating as a PE class. And so we were roller skating, yes. And so in this PE class, the owner of the skating rink you know, told us all the guidelines and all this stuff. And then he gave us a test. We had to have a test on safe skating. <laughs> One of the questions was, what do you do when you fall down? <laughs> and it was a multiple choice. And one of the choices, which of course everybody knew was the wrong choice, was just stay down and wait for somebody to drag you off of the, the rink. And we all laughed and And yet, this is something that I think that too many Christians do. I've got too many people in the church who, after failing, they just sit around and mope. And they kind of wait for somebody to drag them up almost against their will. I mean, really, if you're skating, what happens when you remain down after you've fallen and if you stay there, well, number one, you're not going to skate again if you're just sitting on your behind. But then others are going to trip over you as well. And I think that so many, that so many in the church, are people getting tripped over all the time. Because they just won't get up. But God has taken care of the problem that caused them to fall in the first place. You know, you've fallen because you were trying a trick that wasn't supposed to, you were supposed to be doing. And so you've fallen and saying, hey, you know what? Don't do that anymore. Get up and skate normally. And that's what happened with the Israelites in chapter 7. It was like they were in sin because Achan had taken of the accursed things he was not supposed to take. And because of that, and we talked about this last week, he was the weakest link in a chain. And we as the body of Christ, we are as a chain and so if there's one weak link, that whole chain has become useless. And God had to let them know that you're in this together. You are all in this together. But now Achan had been taken care of. In fact, he had been removed in a brutal manner. And so the sin was gone. And so, hey, the problem's done now get up, let's go. That's something that we saw throughout the, the book of Numbers is that every time there was a major problem, the next chapter would start with, okay, now when you get to the promised land. You know, God's intention is never that we stay put in this little hole that we've dug for ourselves. And so if if you stay in that little hole that you've dug for yourself, then I say maybe you don't belong to the Lord because God's people get back up. God's intention for your life, get back up. Learn to walk. And so with that said, we are in chapter eight. Let's pray. Lord, help us to understand your word. Help us to see you. Help us to see ourselves and help us to walk obediently. Thank you, Lord, for this life you've given us. Thank you for the adventures. And Lord, may we stand with you and watch you win.
always. So fill us with your Holy Spirit and teach us in Jesus' name, amen. Now the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid nor be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you and arise, go up to Ai. See, I've given into your hand the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. Okie doke. He starts off Joshua with an encouragement that we remember back in chapter one. Hey, don't be scared. Turns out Joshua had to have been scared at this point because, you know, we found him on his face going, oh God, what happened? And he didn't know what to do about this. And now Achan... Uh, is, is dead. He and his family are dead. And maybe Joshua's thinking, oh no, maybe there's still some more sin going on. Maybe I don't know what's going on. And, and what used to be a really bold walk has turned into a, okay, I'm going to take a step and I'm not so sure. And so God's telling him, no, don't do that. You don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. Dismayed is a great word. In the Hebrew, the word means, here's the definition, properly to prostrate, hence to break down. Don't just throw yourself on the ground or, or, or be broken down or sit in a corner and quiver. You're not completely broken. So... Don't be afraid. Don't break down. God's plan is still intact. He said, I'm giving you AI. I have given you AI. But take the whole army. Remember they were, in, they were instructed by the spies, hey, we only need about 3,000. We got 3,000 guys. No, you're going to take the whole army. We're going to learn that AI has got only 12,000 people in it. But now it looks like we're going to overkill him. Now, understand something, and what we learned in chapter 7, Israel was in sin. What was the sin? It was Achan. Just when somebody's in sin in the church, the church is in sin, not just that person. And so we are with them in that. And that sin caused great weakness and the inability to face their enemies. But there was another sin that is not so plainly mentioned. And that was something that many of them shared, and that was overconfidence. They saw AI and go, oh, pfft, okay, no problem. <laughs> Look at these guys. Uh. And remember, I was just kind of, you know, talking about Achan and how he was standing there as they were calling names. And, he's, and, and so he's making sure, like, people are, hey, I, you know what? I don't even have a problem with the curse things. I don't have a problem with that. And, and the nature of those who are in sin want to try to put you off of the trail, you know, so that, and so they'll say, hey, whatever you do, just understand I don't have a problem with this, you know. And so that's one thing that we can do. But here's another thing that we can do. We can say those same words because we honestly don't believe we have a problem with it. There are things I can, I mean, right now, right here, right now, I can list for you things that are so not a problem with me. And I mean it. I, and I'm dead serious. It's not like I'm trying to cover something. Seriously, I have no problem with many things. But man, the, the moment I want to boast about that, you know, we're back to Peter and the, and the you know, I'm not going to deny you stuff. We're back to, you know, you start saying, oh, no, that's not my problem. No, that's not my problem. You know, I might be a little bit of a problem here, but I'm definitely not a problem there. Well, cock-a-doodle-doo, man. First Corinthians 10, 12, therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. There are things in your life that might come up and bite you. Why? Because you really believed that could never be a problem of yours. Could just be a serious blind spot. I'm, I'm, I'm having some memories right now of times the Lord revealed to me. He said, you thought you didn't have a problem with that, did you? <laughs> So, 
one of the great sins was overconfidence. Now, this is not to say that because you're so confident in this that now you're supposed to cower in fear over that particular enemy or, or that particular whatever, um, that particular part of your flesh. In fact, I'm still one of those guys that thinks the best way to not do bad, stupid things is to busy yourself doing the right things. And, and so... Uh, Rather than saying, if you're not supposed to think of pink elephants, then we shouldn't even be talking pink elephants. Because now you're thinking of a pink elephant, aren't you? In a tutu. He's got a blue hat on his head. Sorry. <laughs> but as soon as you and I are faced with something that we just don't think is a problem, we're convinced it's not a problem, we often don't put much of the Lord's effort into it. We just take care of it ourselves and soon we got a problem. And that's what happened with them. 3,000 in there to go after AI and it was not, that was not it. So now God's saying, I want you to take the whole army. Take them all in. And so verse two, and you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its cattle you shall take as booty for yourselves. Lay an ambush for the city behind it. <clears throat> ambush, you're gonna sneak around. You're gonna, you know, the word ambush is like, you know, hiding in the bushes. And so that's what you're gonna do. Sneak attack. Um, but this time you're going to keep all the stuff. That was for my wife. <laughs> okay, let's, wait, let's gather it all back in now, okay. <laughs> this time you're going to keep all the stuff. See, before they weren't to take any of the stuff. This time they're going to keep the stuff. Well, wait a minute. Poor Aiken. Think about poor Aiken. Proverbs 28, 20 says, A faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. Had Aiken just been obedient in the next battle, he would have had a, a, a ton of stuff. He would have had the stuff. You and I are to seek the Lord, not the stuff. It's pretty simple. Because God will give you what you need anyway, and he'll give you way more than you need. I, I've never met any Christian who just had barely enough. I'm serious. Every Christian I've ever met had more than what Jesus promises in Matthew chapter 6. Because God gives us abundantly more than we need. He does give us what we need, but he gives us way more than we need. But Achan wanted to take it into his own hands. The rest of them were just going to do it God's way. And so what happens? Everybody gets the stuff that Achan was going for. And Achan has been judged and he's gone. He's dead. Now, this business about the ambush, this is something that you and I might plan. This is something that makes sense. We could, I know, Let's all hide in the bushes and wait till the guy comes out and then we jump him. That plan makes sense. The reason I say that is because sometimes God's plans do make sense to us. Do not judge whether or not something is God's plan by whether or not it makes sense. Some people believe that it can't be God's plan because that just makes too much sense. Or the other way around, of course, you know, that can't be God's plan because I don't understand how that could work. That's usually the problem with us. But some people walk in the other problem. In fact, I think I did when the Lord called us to Fort Bragg. It made perfect sense that my wife and I would move here. Everything made sense. And that's what scared us. But sometimes God's plans will make sense to you and they will be very practical. And so let's go on. Now, there, this is going to come in sections. And this next section we're going to read, we're going to look at verses 3 through 8. And these are the plans, the battle plan. All right, here we go. 
So Joshua arose and all the people of war to go up against Ai. And Joshua chose 30,000 mighty men of valor and sent them away by night. And he commanded them saying, behold, you shall lie in ambush against the city behind the city. Do not go very far from the city, but all of you be ready. I'm kind of doing it in a whisper because they're going to be ambushing. Then I and all the people who are with the, uh, sorry, who are with me will approach the city and it will come about when they come out against us as at first that we shall flee before them. So we're going to run away from them for they will come out after us till we've drawn them from the city. Uh, for they will say they're fleeing before us as at first. Therefore we will, Therefore, we will flee before them. Then you shall rise from the ambush and seize the city, for the Lord your God will deliver it into your hand. And it will be when you have taken the city that you shall set the city on fire according to the commandment of the Lord you shall do. See, I have commanded you. All right, I'm telling you what God's told me and how to do this. So it's a great plan. 30,000 men hiding in the bushes behind Ai and then uh, this smaller group, which Joshua's going to be with them, is going to come in, I imagine they're at the gate of the city, as if they're going to come and attack. And as soon as they're going to be attacked, they turn around and run like chickens to draw them out of the city. And then the 30,000 go in and take care of business. What a plan. So I'm going to need 30,000. By the way, there's over, you know what, 600,000 Soldiers. So all of them are gathered together talking about this. And then he says, okay, I'll need 30,000 of you to do this. Oh, not 30,000 volunteers. I need 30,000 men of valor. Valor. The word means courage and boldness, as in battle. Bravery. Mighty men of of valor, not wimpy boys of cowardice. We are not looking for volunteers. We are looking for the, the men who have proven themselves to walk with the Lord, to stand with the Lord, to fight with the Lord, those who would give themselves up Because we don't need wimps doing this. We don't need guys that just go, well, it was how long we were supposed to wait in the bushes. I got tired. And so I, you know, I, I didn't want to do it anymore. No. These are the strong men. Understand when God chooses his um, armies. I'm right now, I'm, I just started teaching the, the uh, institute, the Bible Institute in Trujillo. <clears throat> And we're doing the pastoral epistles. And I always go back to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. You know, God chooses his people according to their character. Not according to their willingness. But according to their character. And so, notice they're going to come out against Israel the way they did before. Why do you suppose because it worked. That's how our enemy comes out against us. Whatever worked against you last time, Satan is certain it'll work against you again. He knows your weak spots. Now we can blame Satan, but let's go ahead and, and blame our sinful flesh. He, you know, your sinful flesh is weak in certain areas. And so we'll get attacked in those areas the same way. And so the only way to get past this same attack by the enemy is that if we choose to change our game plan, just like Israel changed their game plan, You and I changing our game plan would have to simply be just as Israel did in chapter 7. Repent of secret sin and repent of self-confidence. 
Because those are the two things that make you a sitting duck. And we can't be those people that believe that merely using the name of Jesus, like the sound of his name, in the name of Jesus, that, that something is going to get done. Or those who would claim or plead the blood of Jesus over the situation. Those things will never win a battle as we know from the book of Acts and the seven sons of Sceva, who use the name of Jesus in an attempt to cast out the demons, and the demons just like, whoa, you, yeah, we know Jesus, and we even know Paul, but who the heck are you? And of course, as the story goes, the demons jumped on these men and beat them and stripped them of their clothing and they all ran out screaming like girls. Oh, I'm so tired of listening to people with the, just the right inflection in the name of Jesus. You know, well, this isn't gonna get me because of Jesus. No, look, walk with Jesus. Walk with with Jesus. Don't use his name if you're not walking with him. We've got to choose to live it, think it, believe it so much that we obey it. Because when we walk with the Lord in obedience, that is when the battle is won, not when we say the magic words. Be obedient. And so Israel had this opportunity to be obedient. Done listening to the earlier plans. Done being self-confident. We are listening to the plans from God. And, and, and Joshua is telling them, this is how it's going to go if you do it God's way. And so verse Mm, where am I? Verse 9. Okay, this next section from 9 to 13 is the preparation. So we have the plans, and now we are looking at the preparation. Verse 9. Joshua therefore sent them out, and they went to lie in ambush, and stayed between Bethel and Ai on the west side of Ai. But Joshua lodged that night among the people. Then Joshua rose up early in the morning and mustered the people and went up, he and the elders of Israel, before the people to Ai. And all the people of war who were with him went up and drew near, and they came before the city and camped on the north side of Ai. Now a valley lay between them and Ai. So he took about 5,000 men, set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai on the west side of the city. And when they had set the people on the army, oh, sorry, and when they had set the people, all the army that was on the north of the city and its rear guard on the west of the city, Joshua went that night into the midst of the valley. Okay, um, let's try to figure this out. They're, they're between Bethel and Ai. Now, depending upon who you read, it's anywhere between one and three miles between these two places. And we see there's a valley in there where they're, uh, where they're gonna set another 5,000. We have 30,000 people uh, soldiers behind Ai, and then we have 5,000 soldiers on the west side of Ai. And of course, the rest of them are as that decoy who are gonna, you know, uh, be the bait of, of sorts. Each of them had their responsibilities to perform, just as we in the body of Christ have our responsibilities. Each of us have responsibilities that are different from somebody else's responsibilities. And um, Joshua, what a great leader. He's there with the troops. He's in on it with the troops. He didn't stand back because if, if we only got 35,000 and, the, and then the other group that is to be the, uh, the decoy, well, then we still got almost 2 million people left at the camp. 
Joshua could have stayed there and radioed it in. But he was with them. A great leader is with the troops. And that's all there is to it. And that is one more thing about the difference between the Marine Corps and the U.S. Navy. This is true. We knew that we were the wimps, we being the Navy. And on the other side of the fence there in San Diego, the Marine Corps, they were having their boot camp and we were having our boot camp on our side of the fence. On our side of the fence, we wore, we went out to run around a track wearing tennis shoes and, and little shorts and a t-shirt that said U.S. Navy on it. And so we ran, and you remember me telling the story of how we ran in formation so that we ran as a group. And that was really the lesson. And you know, while we were running around that track, our company commander, the one who bossed us around and yelled at us and made us do push-ups, that guy, he just stood there with a whistle in his mouth. Hey, come on, you guys. I don't think you're going fast enough. Sometimes, and true story, sometimes he wasn't around for half of the day. Because we had little leaders within our group, and they would lead us to where we're supposed to go. Meanwhile, our company commander is nowhere to be found. Meanwhile, over on the other side of the fence, the Marines are running up and down mountains. And we can see them. Seriously, they have all these hills. that They're running up and down, and they're in full fatigues with backpacks, helmets, boots, a gun, and they're doing some singing. And the company commander, I didn't know this until I met some Marines, the company commander did everything he made them do. That makes you want to do it. That's why those are Marines. Marines are different people than sailors. Marines are the ones you send in to fight. Sailors are the ones you say, just stay here. <laughs> and of course, Joshua is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the fact that as, you know, with us in training, the Lord is with us in battle. Hebrews 4, 15, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He sympathizes with us. He's there with us. He is with us everywhere we go. And lo, I am with you always, Jesus says. And as Hebrews says, he will never leave us nor forsake us. He is right there in the battle with us. And if you don't think so, understand that he went to a much more difficult battle than you and I will ever see. And he went there on your behalf. And so Joshua, being a picture of Christ, he is mingling among his people. Okay, so this next section, verses 14 through 17, now, as they go into to, uh, the, the battle, Ai takes the bait. They take the cheese. Verse 14. Now it happened when the king of Ai saw it, that the men of the city hurried and rose early and went out against Israel to battle, he and all his people at an appointed place before the, the plain. But he did not know that there was an ambush against him behind the city. And Joshua and all Israel made as if they were beaten before them and fled by the way of the wilderness. So all the people who were in Ai were called together to pursue them and they pursued Joshua and were drawn away from the city. There was not a man left in Ai or Bethel who did not go out after Israel. So they left the city open and pursued Israel. And so they take the bait. We see Ai and Bethel together. 
The only explanation for this is that as they were sister cities, so to speak, and again, probably just a mile away or two miles uh, between the two places, it is said by commentators, uh, and I only, you know, I'm only giving you what they said because I wasn't there, and I don't think they were there either, but that Bethel, uh, being a sister city with, with Ai, Bethel was not a strong um, city, and so they often spent their time with AI. And it was all, I don't know, maybe you could say it's something like between Fort Bragg and Mendocino, except we're only eight miles apart. Just figure a city just right next to us, and you could just say it's one big community. And so that's probably what's going down here. Um, but of course, and we're grateful that that's not the point of all of this anyway. But the plan is working to a T, of course, because it's God's plan. It says AI rose early as soon as they saw or they heard or they saw they, it was coming at them. And they, they got up and they came out against Israel. Just as our enemy rises early against us. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. When I give these things Verses when I point this spiritual battle out, the sad thing is, is that so many people take this and find, uh, they use this as a reason to be afraid of demons behind every rock. This is not the point of any of this. The facts are, yes, we have an enemy and he's out to get us. But he can't touch us because we belong to the Lord and we walk in obedience. Don't go thinking, oh no, there's a devil over there. What am I going to do? If that's where your head's at, he's got you already. He owns you. But to just realize, just, just walking down a path, if you know there's a drop off here, you don't spend your whole thing, oh, no, 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 no. you just stay on the path, walk on the path. This whole chapter is about victory. And how the enemy couldn't do a thing about it. If you're a Christian and you're walking with the Lord, hey, the enemy can't do a thing about it. So don't, don't get all weird on me. Don't get all weird on yourself. Um, okay, now, verses 18 through 23, the execution of the plan. Here we go. Then the Lord said to Joshua, stretch out the spear that is in your hand toward Ai, for I will give it unto your hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that was in his hand toward the city. So those in ambush arose quickly out of their place. They ran as soon as he had stretched out his hand and they entered the city and took it and hurried to, this, uh, to set the city on fire. And when the men of Ai looked behind them, they saw and behold, the smoke of the city ascended to heaven. So they had no power to flee this way or that way. And the people who had fled to the wilderness turned back on the pursuers. Now, when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city and that the smoke of the city ascended, they turned back and struck down the men of Ai. Then the others came out of the city against them, so they were caught in the midst of Israel, some on this side and some on that side, and they struck them down so that they let none of them remain or escape. But the king of Ai they took alive and brought him to Joshua. Um, we're going to talk about the king of Ai in a second, not right now. Um, so we got Joshua signaling with the spear in his hand. Uh, so that looked, yeah, apparently that was a signal to the troops to come out from behind the bushes and attack. And they waited for Joshua's command. Joshua waited for the Lord's command. They were continually in tune with the Lord in everything they were doing. And, uh, and so everything just worked out. Wonderfully. By the way, those who um, may be listening and are just like, well, what about these poor people of Ai? Hey, 
These poor people of Ai are being judged by God. These are people who were into uh, gross paganism, uh, sins, unmentionable sins, and they had, uh, they had lived their lives past the point of, of uh, uh, well, they were, you know, to the point of no return is where they were. Uh, the inability to ever hear from God, their hearts hardened so badly, and God does not want that influence in the world, and especially there among his people, and so they were judged. And just as we know that God will still judge but he will do all the judging. He used Israel to do the judging then. He does not do that anymore. As the Lord Jesus was judged at the cross and those who refuse the blood of Jesus, those who reject the sacrifice that God has made for them, then they are still in their sins still believing they are good enough without God's help, they too will face judgment. And so God's judgment is right. God's judgment is just. And he does not judge on a whim the way you and I do at a four-way stop. He knows and he has seen and he has been patient and AI's clock has run out. And so, let's look at verse 24. This next section, 24 through 28, is finishing well. Because it looks like, oh, this is great. This is wonderful. And, you know, I've got to confess to you just my own my own life, everything about me. I'm like the lazy man in the proverb who puts his hand in the bowl and, and doesn't have the sense to bring it to his mouth. And, and what a weird picture Solomon gives us there in the, in, in the Proverbs, but, but it speaks of being so lazy that you don't finish what you start. You don't finish what you start. I personally live in a world of unfinished things. And I often will have a project and get to 90%. Yeah, I'll go do something else now. Sin. Whatever God's called us to do, we do it till it's finished. And it came to pass, verse 24, when Israel had made an end of the slaying uh, all the inhabitants of Ai in the field and the wilderness where they pursued them. And when they had all fallen by the edge of the sword until they were consumed, that all the Israelites returned to Ai and struck it with the edge of the sword. So it was that, that all who fell that day, both men and women, were 12,000, all the people of Ai. As I told you before, we got 12,000 people in there. For Joshua did not draw back his hand with which he stretched out the spear until he had utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai. You know, that's where I was going to say, that's kind of where, where I, I, I just know it's within my sinful flesh that, you know, if I were Joshua, you know, as soon as they got about 90% of them, okay, we got them now, good, let, it's okay, we're good. No, it was there until it was finished. Only the livestock and the spoil that the that city, sorry, of uh, that, let me go back, verse 27. Only the livestock and the spoil of that city Israel took as booty for themselves according to the word of the Lord which he had commanded Joshua. So Joshua burned Ai and made it a heap forever, a desolation to this day. I think it's, it's, uh, it's fitting because Ai, when we first see Ai, it's in, um, I believe it's chapter 12 or 13 of, of uh, Genesis when Abraham sets up his tent uh, between Bethel and Ai. You know, Ai means a heap of ruin. How do you like to live in a city called a heap of ruin? And then it comes true. And there it was as a heap. I, I, just for fun, I just want to draw your attention back to verse 9 again. They stayed between Bethel and Ai. And 
just humor me for a second while I over-spiritualize this. Bethel means house of God. And at the beginning of this battle, where is it that they're camping? Where are they waiting? Between the house of God and a heap of ruin. Understand that that's, you know, that's where in all our obedience, we do have that choice between the house of God and a heap of ruin. That's where when Abraham, he pitched his tent between Bethel and Ai, between the house of God and a heap of ruin. And I think a lot of people want to pitch their tent there because they can't make up their mind of which way they really want to go. They think they can walk that fence. But here, it wasn't about you know, not making up their mind about which way they wanted to go. It was just the best place to, you know, uh, logistically speaking, to, to camp so that the battle would be won. But still, they hung between the two, the house of God and a heap of ruin. In all your camping, may we all fall toward the house of God in all your walking, and all your doing, because the heap of ruin is always after you. But you and I have got to make that choice. Um, so there's AI. It's all tore up. What a mess. Um, so Joshua didn't draw his hand back until it was all done, until it was finished. Little battles, big battles, you and I are supposed to Keep going until it's finished. And then the big battle of all, just your life, my life. We are encouraged throughout the New Testament to persevere, to walk with the Lord to the end. And it's how you finish that matters. 2 Timothy 4, 7, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, kept the faith. And what, is, what does Jesus say there in Matthew 25 about the parable of the talents? Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. He doesn't say 90%, not bad. We're to finish. We are to finish. In verse 29, and the king of Ai... He hanged on a tree until evening, and as soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded that they should take his corpse down from the tree, cast it at the entrance of the gate of the city, and raise it a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Man. To this day, that is the writing of this. Hanged him on a tree. They learned in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 and 23, if a man has committed a sin deserving of death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. And so they hanged him on the tree just to display him, put him on display, but then took him down because this land is to be holy now. And so he was to be taken down uh, to bury him after that. And so they put that heap of stones over him. It was, it, was a, it was shame. It was all about shame. As I said, put him on display, the king of this wicked city. And of course, as we see that from Deuteronomy chapter 21, and we consider even the king of Ai, who had to be one of the worst men We don't know anything other than that he was the king of our wicked city. And so his shame was put on display. He got what he deserved. Galatians 3.13 tells us something about Jesus. It says, 
Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And that Jesus was willing to lay down his perfect life and be cursed for us so that we wouldn't be cursed. And he experienced shame as the king of Ai was shamed. The son of God was shamed in the same manner that you and I would never be put to shame. It's an amazing thing. In verse 30, now, Joshua built an altar to the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the children of Israel, it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones over which no man has wielded an iron tool. And they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. This is from chapter 27 of Deuteronomy. Excuse me. And uh, this is about 20, 25 miles away from Ai. So, you get the whole flow of things. They just had a major victory. And what did they do after that major victory? They hoofed it over to Mount Ebal. Why? They're still not done. After the victory, there was no victory parade, but instead a sacrifice to God. There is humility, the burnt offering, the peace offering on an altar made of stones where there were no iron tool was used on him, meaning that, that man would not doll it up to make it something uh, that was uh, pleasurable to him because the sacrifice was never to be pleasurable other than in the giving to the Lord of it. Just as we know of the cross of Jesus Christ, you know, we, we doll it up and we make jewelry out of it. And, and yeah, I know, we, it's to, we remember what he's done for us, but when you think about the actual altar which Jesus was sacrificed on for us, it was gross, it was ugly, it was disgusting. And this was the reason that they were not to make, you know, make this ornate altar, lest people would worship the altar instead of worshiping the God that they are sacrificing to. Because you and I are not to worship the cross. We worship God Almighty in humility because of what he has done. And so we see that after this victory over Ai, it was sacrifice and humility. The last time they fought, uh, the last time they had a victory, that was in Jericho, they were bubbling over with self-confidence. And so for every victory that you and I have, the best thing to do is just go to the cross and say, thank you, Lord. You are the one. In verse 32, and there in the presence of the children of Israel, he wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written. And then all Israel with their elders and officers and judges stood on either side of the ark before the priests, the Levites who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord, the stranger as well as he who was born among them. Half of them were in front of Mount Gerizim and half of them in front of Mount Ebal as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded before that they should bless the people of Israel. This, again, from Deuteronomy chapter 27, it was commanded that they would do this when they arrived there. And now that they've arrived, they, they built the altar, they sacrificed to the Lord, and now they're going to pronounce the blessings and the cursings. And the picture of the scenery there with Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal and this I shared with you back in Deuteronomy chapter 27. I'm just going to give you the same thing again because the information is still the same. Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal were two masses of limestone rock reaching 2,700 and 2,000 feet above sea level. 
And between, between them lay a beautiful valley about 300 yards wide. We believe that to be the Valley of Shechem. And the mountains themselves were pictures of blessing and cursing. On all hands, it is allowed that Gerizim abounds with springs, gardens, and orchards, and that it is covered with a beautiful uh, verdure. That's, uh, you're, that's a word I struggle with. While Ebal is as naked and barren as a rock. So you get this thing. You're looking at Mount Gerizim over here, and it is lush. It's green. It's wonderful. And over here, just a dry, rotten, naked land. And so the curses were pronounced from Ebal, and the blessings were pronounced from Gerizim. And so everybody there in that valley had a real strong visual. I don't know who said this. I think this was David Guzik. The fact that there was an altar that while they would pronounce the blessings and the cursings, says the fact that there was an altar is that God anticipated their failure. Substitutes would have to be sacrificed. And so they would have to know, even as they pronounce the blessings and the cursings, that they're going to have to sacrifice to the Lord because they're going to fail. Let's finish this up, verse 33. Or did I already do verse 33? Yes, I did 33. We're doing 34. And afterward, he read all the words of the law, the blessings, the cursings, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded, which Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel with the women, the little ones, the strangers who were living among them. It was for everybody. Nobody was exempt to all because it is for all. Not just the blessings, but all of the law. Remember something about God, and you saw it in Jesus as you read through the Gospels, that God is not a salesman. He doesn't give you half the story just so that you'll buy into this. But God gives the whole story. And so if they were going to experience any success in the promised land in any further battles, they would have to understand the word of God. They would have to give themselves over to the Lord and be obedient to the word of God. And in all of their stumbling and all of their failure, they would have to practice repentance and humility and we're going to see that they did pretty good, actually, the first generation there as they, you know, they, they subdued the land. But from that point on, it just kept getting uglier and uglier for them. But the encouragement for you and me is that you and I, we're going to win sometimes because we did it God's way. And we're going to lose sometimes because we did it our way. And then with some repentance, we're going to win again. But once we've won again, just go to the Lord in humility and walk with him in humility and let him be the good one. Let him be the boss. Let him be all the greatness. And we just be obedient. Father, thank you for your word. And pray that uh, should anybody be watching right now that's dealing with, living in, practicing some sin or sinfulness, got some kind of weird way of thinking, that you would convict them and that they would repent, and that your church would be strong, Lord, and that there wouldn't be weakness in your church, but that we would be realistic about ourselves, bringing ourselves to you, and realistic about you and your holiness and righteousness. And Lord, we want to praise you and thank you for every battle won, because you have definitely won many battles in our lives, through our lives, to your glory. And so for all of those won battles, may we not take it to ourselves. As your word says, not to us, but to you, Lord, be the glory and honor and the praises that we would come to you plainly. Thank you for the cross. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.